Today we will learn and reflect on how democracy developed in ancient Greece under the reforms mostly of Draco and Solon and the main reform of Cleisthenes. Hand in hand with the development of democracy in ancient Greece was the rise of trial by jury, which enabled citizens to appeal actions by magistrates to jury trials and the beginnings of a formal judicial system. Our Greek philosophers and historians seek to demonstrate how the character of Solon, one of the ancient Greek sages, strengthened the moral fiber of Athens. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video, and please feel free to follow along with our PowerPoint script posted to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. Homer's Odyssey depicts the deep Greek past where might makes right, where brave soldiers fight for justice, where grievances and murders are settled by blood feuds. As Greek emerged from its dark ages in the 7th century, the Greeks in Athens sought to establish a more systematic system of justice with laws governing the state. Draco was appointed by the ruling aristocracy to be the lawmaker to codify new laws to replace justice by feuds and now the Senate of the Areopagus would hear the cases of homicide. The modern historian Will Durant states that Draco's code congealed the cruel customs of unregulated feudalism, but it did not mitigate the exploitation of the weak by the strong, and the rights of the property owners were protected more zealously than before. Petty theft, even idleness, was punished harshly. We remember Draco when we discuss unduly harsh or draconian laws and his laws were draconian even by ancient standards. Someone asked Draco why most crimes carried the death penalty. Draco replied, the petty crimes deserved the death penalty, so he could not find a heavier penalty for more serious offenses. Now we might ask, why not send petty criminals to spend a few months in prison? The answer was, there were no prisons in the ancient world. There were no police, just as there were no policemen, no public prosecutors, and there were few jails. Practically, the only punishments available were fines, execution, and exile. We know little about Draco and less about the other Greek city-states, but we do know that the civil strife between the lower and upper classes and those who work and those who live lives of luxury sparked revolution in several Greek city-states, where disaffected aristocrats called tyrants seized absolute power with help from the lower classes. Plutarch exclaimed that in the time of Solon, who lived several decades after Draco, this disparity between the rich and the poor had reached a peak. This city was in an extremely precarious state, and it looked as though the only way it could settle down and put an end to all the turmoil was by the establishment of a tyranny. There was great strife between the notables and the masses in Athens. Plutarch tells us all the common people were in debt to the wealthy members of society because either they paid them a sixth of the produce they gained from working the lands, which is why they were called the sixth parters, or else they had put up their own persons as collateral for their debts, and when they defaulted, they could become slaves of Athens or be sold into slavery abroad. The creditors were so ruthless that people were often forced to sell even their own children or go into exile. Many of them banded together to seek to remove the debts, redistribute the land, and form an entirely new system of government. These class tensions were also felt by the Athenian aristocracy, so later in the 7th century they decided to elect Solon as Archon, granting him, as Will Durant says, dictatorial powers to soothe the social war, establish a new constitution, and restore stability to the state and the upper classes, trusting to the conservatism of a moneyed man, reluctantly consented. And Plutarch says Solon was given the power to resolve disputes and make laws. The rich found him acceptable because of his wealth, and the poor found him acceptable because of his integrity. So who is this remarkable great man in history? Well, Durant marvels, it seems incredible that in ancient Athens, a man was found who, without any act of violence or any bitterness of speech, was able to persuade the rich and the poor to a compromise that not only averted social chaos, but established a new and more generous political and economic order for as long as Athens was an independent city-state. Plutarch exclaims that although he was an aristocrat himself, Solon was not impressed by wealth. Solon, in his poetry, exclaims that 
two people are equally well off when one has much silver and gold in wide wheat bearing fields and horses and mules, while the other has only enough to keep belly, body, and feet in comfort and to enjoy the youthful bloom of women and boy when they too arrive and become agreeable in their season. And also Solon exclaims, money I would like to have but not unjustly gained, for in the end justice always comes. Plutarch exclaimed, men are burdened by endless troubles and anxieties if they have not been trained by reason in how to cope with fortune, and we can see that in the current day with the winners of the lotteries. Such people cannot enjoy their possession of something they really want, because it only makes them suffer pangs of anxiety and apprehension about the future in case they lose their wealth. Now when we talk about the reforms of Solon, one of our main sources is the Athenian constitution. And this is the only study of the many studies of Greek city-state constitutions that the students of Athens completed. Now most scholars have concluded from the quality of the composition that Aristotle was neither the author nor the lecturer of this work. And we want to point out the Constitution is a translation for a Greek term that evidently referred not to a specific founding document, but rather to an entire framework of laws enacted by a prominent lawgiver assigned to this task. That is why we refer not to Aristotle in our video, but to Aristotle's student, where he explains that on gaining control of affairs, Solon liberated the people, both immediately and for the future, by forbidding loans on the security of the person so that they couldn't be sold into slavery. And he enacted laws, and he canceled both public and private debts, which the Athenians call the shaking off of burdens, since this weight was lifted from their shoulders. Plutarch exclaims that Solon also quickly repealed all of Draco's laws, except the ones on homicide, because the penalties were too severe. Death was the penalty for almost all crimes, which meant that those convicted of loitering or selling fruits or vegetables, as well as those guilty of homicide, could potentially be subject to the death penalty. Now before Solon, the oligarchs who ruled the city-state were the hereditary nobility. Solon established new classes for the newly rich, enabling them also to share in the government if they met certain property requirements, which were based on the amount of crops harvested on their farmland. Before democracy could be extended to the workers of Athens, which would happen in the days of Pericles, it first had to be extended to the newly rich. Aristotle's student said that these were the most democratic features of Solon's constitution. First and most important, the ban on loans on the security of the person meant that you no longer could sell yourself into slavery to pay your debts. First and foremost, the ban on loans on the security of the persons meant that it was impossible for the peasant to sell himself into slavery to pay his debts. Second, it gave permission to anyone who wished to seek retribution for those who were wrong through the popular jury and court system. Third, the reform that particularly contributed to the power of the masses was the right of appeal to the jury court. Thus, democracy and justice were intertwined in ancient Athens in these reforms. Aristotle's students said, the poorer people had thought that Solon would carry out a complete redistribution of property, while the nobles had thought that he would restore them to the same position as before or make only small changes. But Solon was opposed to both. While he could have combined with whichever party he chose and become a tyrant, he preferred to incur the hatred of both by saving his country and legislating for the best. And Plutarch observed, Solon's cancellation of the debts annoyed the rich, and the poor were even more aggrieved at his failure to redistribute the land as they expected. And because he had not completely removed the disparities and inequalities between men and their incomes, as Lycurgus of Sparta had done. Many of Solon's reforms were amazingly progressive for the time. They include that the rich and poor were subject to the same restraints and penalties. Both rich and poor were eligible to serve on juries. The property tax was, in essence, a graduated income tax, and the most impoverished were exempted from paying taxes at all. And it forbade the export of any produce except for olive oil. And Solon was trying to encourage olive production, which would be central to the later Athenian economy. And he did this so the Athenian economy would be more prosperous. Now, sons were not obligated to support aging fathers who had not taught them a trade. Because in the ancient world, there's no such thing as welfare or social security. You had to depend on your family for your sustenance. And continuing with the reforms, although wronged husbands were permitted to kill adulterers caught in the act, there would only be a hefty fine for violating the honor of a free woman. And this distinction was meant to protect the bloodlines of all the Athenian families. 
Also amazingly, the son of soldiers and sailors who died in war would be brought up and educated at state expense. This was not common. Very few ancient societies did this. And many of the medieval European states and Renaissance states wouldn't do this either. Also, uh, Solon legalized and taxed prostitution in brothels licensed and supervised by the state. And he granted amnesty to political prisoners, but not insurrectionists. Well, Duran exclaims that his laws liberating the Athenian farmers from serfdom and the establishment of a peasant proprietor class whose ownership of the soil made the little armies of Athens sufficient to preserve her liberties for many generations. And indeed, in the Persian Wars, the little army of Athens defeated the mighty Persian army. When, at the close of the Peloponnesian War, it was proposed to limit the franchise to freeholders, only 5,000 adult freemen in all Attica failed to satisfy this requirement. Once when he was asked if the laws he passed were the best possible laws, Solon answered, they were the best the Athenians would accept. When asked about what made the qualities of a well-ordered state, Solon responded, when the people obey the rulers, and the rulers obey the laws. Rather than becoming tyrant, Solon decided that he would leave Athens to travel the known world for a decade so they could not change the laws, but rather learn to live under them, as he knew that he would be continually pressured by all sides to amend the laws to undo these peacekeeping measures. His wanderings took him to Lydia on the coast of Persia and the court of the fabulously wealthy King Croesus, who was way too proud of his wealth and way too boastful. According to Diogenes of Laertius, some say that Croesus, after arraying himself in all his finery and sitting himself on his throne, asked Solon if he'd ever seen a more delightful sight. Yes, Solon replied, roosters and pheasants and peacocks, since they have been adorned with a natural brilliancy and are 10,000 times more beautiful. Due to the wisdom of his laws and his declining to be a tyrant, Greeks held Solon in high regard. He was regarded as one of this ancient seven sages. We know this from another story Herodotus tells us on how King Croesus escaped the flames of Cyrus. Now the hubris and overconfidence of King Croesus led him to rashly attack the upcoming Cyrus the Great, and through brilliant tactics Croesus was defeated. King Cyrus ordered that Croesus be placed on a pyre that would be set ablaze. Herodotus tells us, and Croesus remembered with what divine truth Solon had declared that no man could be called happy until he was dead. Now in our video on Herodotus, we already told you the delightful tales Solon told of the humble Greeks who were happier than Croesus, because they died the good death when they were happy with loving families and divine purpose. One of these tales featured Cleobus and Biton, which we repeated in our Herodotus Histories video. And we left the tale for how Croesus was saved from the flames until this video. As the pyre was lit, Croesus sighed bitterly and three times in anguish of spirit uttered Solon's name. Solon, Solon, Solon. So Cyrus heard this and asked, who was this Solon? Croesus then told Cyrus how Solon had once come to Sardis and made light of the splendor he saw there and how everything he had said proved true not only for him, but for all men, and especially for those who imagine themselves fortunate. The story touched Cyrus. He realized, too, that he was mortal, and was burning alive another who had once been as prosperous as he. The thought of that, and the fear of retribution, and the realization of how unstable human affairs were, made him change his mind in order that the flames be put out. And Solon's poem to his friend Phocus discusses his decision to leave Athens for a decade. Did I spare the land of my birth? Did I refrain from tyranny and brutality, preferring to keep my name unblemished by disgrace? There's no shame for me in this. In fact, I think it will set me above all other men. But his reforms weren't completely successful. Class tensions between the workers and the aristocracy continued even under the laws Solon had instituted. So his cousin, Pisistratus, was ambitious and sought to become the tyrant himself. Diogenes of Laertius exclaimed that the people would have gladly had Solon rule him as a tyrant, but Solon declined. In perceiving the ambitions of Pisistratus as kinsman, he did all he could to hinder him. He dashed into the Athenian assembly once with spear and shield, and he warned the people about Pisistratus. He proclaimed, Men of Athens, I am wiser than some of you and braver than others, wiser than those who fail to discern his deception and braver than those who wish to keep silent out of fear. 
but in later years during the third term of Pisistratus as tyrant, Solon laid down his weapons and made peace with Pisistratus and may have become one of his counselors. Pisistratus succeeded in becoming tyrant but was driven from power after only a few years. Herodotus tells us how the Athenians fell for a ridiculous trick that re-established Pisistratus as tyrant for the second time. In the village of Paeania, there was a handsome woman called Phi, nearly six feet tall, whom they fitted out in a suit of armor and mounted her in a chariot. Then after getting her to pose in a most striking attitude, she and Pisistratus drove into Athens, where messengers who had preceded them were there already, talking to the people and urging them to welcome Pisistratus back, because the goddess Athena herself had shown him extraordinary honor and was bringing him back to her own Acropolis. And later in the Peloponnesian War, the outrageous Alcibiades would pull the same stunt when he rode back into Athens. Now Pisistratus was again driven out, but the third time he seized power, he reigned for 19 years until his death. Well, Durant tells us, Pisistratus surprised everyone by making few changes to the Solon constitution. Like Emperor Caesar Augustus, he knew how to adorn and support dictatorship with democratic concessions and forms. Although unlike Caesar Augustus, under Pisistratus, the Athenian government did actually function as a democracy, except that all the people who were in power in the democracy were put there by Pisistratus. Pisistratus ruled benevolently among his accomplishments. He divided among the poor the land belonging to the state and banished aristocrats. He employed many workers on public projects, including building temples, roads, and aqueducts. And he established the Pan-Hellenic Athletic Contests. And he encouraged the theater and instructed poets to write down Homeric epics for easier recitation. Wilderan exclaims that under his rule, trade flourished. The poor were less poor, and the rich not less rich. The concentration of wealth, which had nearly torn the city into civil war, was brought under control. Will Durant so elegantly concludes, Probably Athens had needed, after Solon, just a man as Pisistratus, one with sufficient iron in his blood to beat the disorder of Athenian life into a strong and steady form, and to establish those habits of order and law, which are to a society what the skeleton is to an animal. And also when, after a generation, the dictatorship was removed, these habits of order and the framework of Solon's constitution remained as a heritage for democracy. Pisistratus, perhaps not knowing it, had come not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. After Pisistratus died, his son Hippias continued his policies and ruled benevolently for a dozen years. But then a fair gone awry caused his brother's assassination, leading to paranoia and an increasingly brutal regime, which led to a coup that established democracy in Athens. And you can read the sordid tale, if you like, in Herodotus and Thucydides. Now, in the chaos, an aristocrat named Chlysisthenes was triumphant. In his dictator, he drafted laws to fundamentally change how the city-state was organized to finally break the hold the oldest and richest families had over the government. He abolished the four regional tribes and replaced them with ten tribes that consisted of subdivisions called deems. And each tribe was allocated deems from the city and the coast and the interior, which meant the people in each tribe were spread all over Attica. You can read for yourself the details. The effect was that more citizens were involved in the democracy that had a much broader base. And another reform of Cleisthenes was the ostracism. Once a year, the assembly would be able to call an ostracism, and that was a special election with a quorum of 6,000 citizens, where the citizens, if they met quorum, could choose to send into exile any citizen for 10 years. While they were in exile, their property was not seized, and they could eventually return to Athens. And the purpose was to discourage demagogues, and during the 90 years it was in effect, only 10 men were ostracized. Archaeologists have uncovered many ostracons. We have a picture of one ostracon that was cast to exile the Greek politician Themistocles, who had been a hero of the Greco-Persian Wars. The final reforms creating the radical Athenian democracy were enacted under the famous Athenian general Pericles, who will be featured in a future video. And we'll conclude our discussion with a quote from Diogenes of Laertius. Solon gave men this advice. Trust good character more than an oath. Do not lie. Pursue worthy goals. Command only when you have learned to be ruled. Give the best advice, not the most pleasant. Make reason your guide. Have no dealings with base men. Honor the gods and respect your parents. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. 
There were references to Aristotle's Athenian constitution and ancient sources, but it was a lost work until scholars found two papyrus manuscripts, one in 1879 and another with fewer missing pages in 1890. And this constitution was one of many school assignments. Aristotle had his students gather and summarize the law codes and histories from over a hundred Greek city-states, but only the Athenian constitution survived, just barely. Our translator argues from the inferior writing style and organization, we can presume that Aristotle did not write this work, nor did he heavily edit it. So in our footnotes, we credit it to Aristotle's student. Without this important work, we would know little about the details and history of democracy and juries in Athens. Plutarch's Lives of Noble Greeks and Romans is our next major source. He's a delight to read and one of the most reliable ancient historians and biographers. Plutarch clearly uses the Athenian constitution as one of his sources. you got to keep in mind he wrote his lives in the beginning of the 2nd century AD, about 450 years after Aristotle. The chief manuscripts date from the 10th and 11th century, and neither Dr. Wikipedia nor translators say much about the manuscript tradition. But since all of his lives have survived, there are likely many manuscripts. Plutarch wrote his lives in pairs with noble Greeks and Romans. In the Roman he paired with Solon, Poplicola was a stalwart Roman, but he didn't steer the Roman state in a new direction, as did Solon for Greece. However, the U.S. founding fathers did admire Poplicola, and giving him the pen name Publius in the Federalist Papers was in honor of Poplicola. Both Plutarch and Diogenes of Sinope sought to draw moral lessons from their histories, and Diogenes is a quirky source, and he was neither as accurate nor as elegant as Plutarch. We discussed Diogenes in our lectures on Zeno, the Greek Cynic philosophers, and the Epicurean philosophers, and we quoted some memorable phrases from Diogenes here. And Will Durant's Life of Greece, you can barely read it from the cover, written in 1939, is a classical history. He's an excellent writer, as you can tell from his quotations. And his primary sources for Draco and Solon are also Aristotle's Constitution, Plutarch, and to a lesser extent Diogenes, and many other modern scholars. The histories of Herodotus are an excellent history for the period of Pisistratus, and the visit of Solon to Croesus in Persia, and how Hippias, son and successor of Pisistratus, was overthrown after a rule of more than a dozen years. And we have three videos and blogs on the histories of Herodotus. And in the painting we used in our thumbnail, we can clearly see the contrast between the ostentatious feathered hat and the rich red robes of King Croesus that are so regal that two servant boys follow him to hold up his train trailing behind. Contrasted with that, the more simply dressed visitor Solon, who's dressed like a shepherd, who's unimpressed by the wealth that Croesus insists on showing him. Although Solon was somewhat wealthy himself, he did not like to parade his wealth. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.